23 Reflections 2 When was our war for independence? A Mozambican freedom fighter. It takes a village to raise a child. You have heard it many times. But what you may not have heard is that it also takes a network to mature an activist. One of my sources of network maturity came from friendships I formed with individuals who had experienced a totally different world from mine in ordinary time. Some of these contacts were realized in such forums like the Stockholm Conference and the IUCN Congresses in Bangkok and Barcelona. I met a young man from Mozambique at the Environmental Forum in Stockholm in 1972 who set me thinking about my own history. I don't recall his name, but he was born in Mozambique of mixed parentage, resulting in his light brown complexion and curly hair. He had been educated in Lisbon, Portugal, but somewhere along his journey, he had come to the realization that he needed to use his education for the liberation of his people. Instead of returning to the luxury of his parents' home in Maputo, the capital city, he went into the bush to join the rebels of Frelimo in the fight for freedom. Having been injured early in the conflict, he was evacuated out of the war zone to Tanzania, where he recuperated. Given his level of education, he rejoined the political wing of the Mozambican Liberation Front of Frelimo, and it is through their auspices that he attended the Environmental Forum in Stockholm in 1972. For those of you who may be interested, the War of Independence in Mozambique ended with a ceasefire on September 8, 1974, resulting in a negotiated independence in 1975. What appealed to me in his conversation were the questions he asked about the origin of the OI Committee. He liked how we had rescued the environmental forum, but wanted to know if I had participated in Guyana's war for independence. Well, frankly speaking, sitting in front of the governor's car on throne speech day didn't quite sound like a liberation battle. I proceeded to tell him that our independence was won at a conference at Marlborough House in London in 1964, leading to the granting of independence in 1966. This Mozambican fighter listened to my account of Guyana's history with a face of disbelief. You mean the British gave you independence at a conference in some aristocrat's house? Are you sure? He explained in his emphatic African accent the atrocities of Leopold IV in the Congo, the French in Algeria, the Dutch in East Asia. How come the British, a leading imperialist power in this time, would behave different in the Caribbean? He concluded that it must have been because India had drained their will to fight. Who fought for our independence? That discourse left me with no other choice but to reconstruct in my head how it is that I had missed our war for independence in the British West Indies. It was then that it dawned on me that it was because ours was fought in 1801 to 1804 in Haiti. In a televised interview in 2016, the Haitian ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Jacques Junior Baril, was asked this question by a news commentator. Why would Haiti be expecting to join the Organization of African Union when it was not geographically connected to the continent of Africa? His response was masterful. He corrected her, stating that actually, Haiti should have been the first member of the African Union because it paid a very high price through its revolution in 1804 for the liberation of all Africans, both on the continent and in the New World. 
Many of the new governments in the British West Indies had decided after their independence to declare August 1 as Emancipation Day. The date August 1, 1834 marked the end of the slave trade in the British Empire when the 1833 Abolition of Slavery Act finally came into force. In many British former colonies in the Caribbean, as well as in Canada, August 1 is celebrated as Emancipation Day. An astute author, Patriarch Scanlan, wrote in the Washington Post 2021 that the British conception of emancipation cemented imperialism and the vast exploitation rather than ending it. For him, the origins of emancipation in the British West Indies were to be found in the many rebellions against slavery, such as the Tula Slave Revolt in Curacao in 1795, the Bossa Rebellion in Barbados in 1818, Coffee in Demerara in 1823, or Sam Shark in Jamaica in 1831. I rooted mine in the Haitian Revolution of 1804. You can go even further back to the story of the First Maroon War in Jamaica. The First Maroon War that started around 1728 was a conflict between the Jamaican Maroons and the colonial British authorities, and it continued until the peace treaties of 1739 and 1740. It was led by slaves who had escaped from their plantations to become mountain-dwelling fighters. The name Maroon was given to these fighters, and for many years they harassed the British colonial government in Jamaica. Having tasted their freedom, these Maroons were determined to preserve it at all costs. Their major tactic may be described as the forerunner of modern guerrilla warfare. Half a century later, even the creator of independent Haiti, Toussaint Louverture, is reported to have remarked that, and I quote, In Jamaica, they are in the mountains, blacks who have forced the English to make treaties with them. Well, I am black like them, and I know how to make war, end quote. To me, every school child in the Caribbean should be taught to anchor our independence in the event known as the Haitian Revolution. Many of our historians have spoken of the Caribbean as the oldest colonial sphere with the most extreme experience of colonization and the most remarkable drama of culture building in the modern world since 1996 and 1980. Culture building is found in the structure of the land systems that emerged within these autonomous regions controlled by former enslaved Africans while in the midst of a world dominated by slave societies. We see evidence of this all around us. The Samaka or Salamaka are one of the six Maroon peoples formerly called Bush Negroes in the Republic of Suriname and one of the Maroon peoples in French Guiana. In 2007, the Saramaka won a ruling in the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, supporting their right to lands they had historically occupied over claims to the country by the national government in Suriname. Liberté, Egalité et Fraternité There is an even stronger reason why we should reconnect ourselves to the goals of these early communities and those of the Haitian Revolution. It has to do with how we interpret the motivations wrapped up in the Haitian Revolution. I have always been intrigued with the adoption of the Haitian Revolution of the motto of the French Revolution, Liberté, Egalité and Fraternité. We can all agree that the Haitian Revolution was about liberté, liberty, freedom. This would have been consistent with the historical aims of enslaved peoples and manifested in the successful Maroon Wars that preceded the Haitian Revolution. Egalité is also easy to translate into English as meaning equality. This could be understood as social and political equality. It serves to remind us that these slave revolts were not struggles to become an equal part of European society. They were seeking equality in their own right as a separate and distinct entity with equal status with their former masters. 
The concept of fraternité in the Haitian model is the one that is open to interpretation. The historian Mona Ozouf has explained that although liberté and égalité were associated with this motto during the 18th century, fraternité was not always included in it. In fact, other terms as amitié, friendship, charité, charity, and union, unity, were often added in its place. Let me tell you what I found out about Mona Ossouf. Mona Ossouf was born Mona Anik Soya in 1931 in the family of school teachers keen on preserving the language and culture of Brittany. She graduated as a teacher of philosophy from the École Normale Supérieure de Genville and went on to become a French historian and philosopher. Whatever you wish to know about the French Revolution, read Mona Ossouf. At the time of the inception of the Haitian Revolution, a propaganda poster from 1793 representing the First French Republic bore the slogan, Unity and Indivisibility of the Republic, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity or Death. That was the English translation. It is my strong belief that this fraternité may have had a different meaning to different leaders of the Haitian Revolution. Toussaint may have interpreted it as meaning brotherhood, and as such he treated Napoleon as his brother, a sentiment that was not reciprocated by Napoleon Bonaparte. You don't imprison your brother and leave him to die in jail. Dessalines, however, by his action, must have interpreted fraternité as meaning legitimité, legitimacy, that is, a recognition as belonging to the same family of nations. Haiti's very first flag as an independent nation is said to have been created by the revolutionary leader Jean-Jacques Dessalines himself. It's said that he took a French flag, tore out the white part, and then sewed the red and the blue together to make the first Haitian flag. This cannot be considered a repudiation of the motto of the revolution. It was a sure insistence on the recognition of the legitimacy of the Republic of Haiti. And Haiti went on to pay a very high price for such a recognition. From the United States, 23 years and then a 15 year military occupation, and from the French, 90 million francs in reparations. The Salinis appear to be interpreting fraternity in the sense of brotherhood of equal nations. His act is best portrayed in the statue located at the Chandemar Boulevard in downtown Port-au-Prince, right opposite the presidential palace, or what is left of it since the 2017 earthquake. With his left leg extended, with a broken shackle at the ankle denoting a hard-fought freedom, a machete in the right hand showing the strength to fight, and a conch shell at the lips alerting the masses to awaken, it boldly proclaims without compromise, Nous pas bana, nous neg marron. We are not white, we are fighting black maroon. We are slowly getting to this understanding in the rest of the Caribbean. It was refreshing to listen to the new Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre, in his first emancipation address, August 1st, 2021, stating, Emancipation Day calls for us to pay homage to the resistance of armed rebellions like the 1794 to 1798 Brigand Wars in St. Lucian and the 1804 Haitian Revolution. The commemoration of emancipation will not, however, be confined to giving greater recognition to August 1. It has to be a process of continuous education and so this government will take steps to ensure that African, Caribbean and St. Lucian history is taught at all levels of our schools. We will also examine the possibility of making Creole an official language of our country. Legitimacy versus Legality 
Once I had the privilege to join a team of experts to discuss social liberation matters in the Caribbean while sailing in a boat in the Gulf of Paria. It was one of those common sense convois of the Lloyd Best Institute of the Caribbean. The conversation gave us all a unique opportunity to look on the landmass of Trinidad in the way that Columbus may have seen it, but at the same time to distinguish between the things we can see and those we can't without a closer inspection by our own intellect. I decided to focus totally on the fact that in our law faculty, we didn't seem to teach our new barristers to recognize the tension between legality and legitimacy. The eminent jurist and Sunday Express columnist, Martin Daly, was among the participants and I was pleased to hear him endorse my position. However, very few in the academic community seem to have read our history in the same way that I did. Legality refers to what fits within the law and is compliant with a legal code. It limits us and determines what we can and cannot do according to the law. Legitimacy, however, is more powerful. It symbolizes what has been accepted through the collective will of the people as being fair, genuine, moral, and ethical. The more interesting fact is this. It is legality that usually struggles to keep a pace with legitimacy. In my days, children born out of wedlock were considered to be illegitimate by the law, but not by the common folk. In villages in Caribbean society, all children were accepted equally. However, it is the law that had to be corrected to accept the legacy claims of children of the same father but different mothers to the estate of their deceased father. For me as a land administration expert, this history was expressed in the different forms of land tenure that we sought to make legal. Generation land and commonage were the classic examples to be found in the Bahamas. As a coordinator of an eco project in 2014, I encouraged my fellow researchers to look for practices that may have emerged from among these unofficial land settlements. Caribbean peoples sometimes view certain physical spaces as sacred land. That is legal freehold treaty land that has been transformed into sacred space by oral tradition, ritual, and ancestral burial grounds. This sacred landscape is further reinforced by family bonds traced from first-time Maroons through both men and women with the right of use to house yards, provision grounds, etc. The young lawyers in the Caribbean need to be taught this part of our history as part of their legal training.